Alrighty. Welcome back, everyone, and Dyer welcome to the entry level matchup between Aber Zombie and Lich and Kick Ass Patrol. For those of you who are frequent viewers of the Darman Cast channel, you know Aber Zombie and Lich is one of the teams that I cast for the first time last week. Ten seconds remaining. So they're definitely getting some some FaceTime here remaining. on the Darman Cast channel. And in that matchup, they actually lost 0-2 to two against Team Lincolns, but they're, they're back in fighting force. They put up a hell of a fight in Game 1 where they were able to drag the game out for 54 minutes. They ultimately lost, but when we finally did tune into their match, they were already down two sets of racks and were able to defend their third one valiantly for the last five or six minutes that we were able to watch the match. Ten seconds remaining. And here in game two, you have Abra Zombie and Lich opening things off by Dire team pick. what I can only imagine is a respect ban to the Legion Commander, who did see some action in game one. He's going to be banned out here in game two, as is the Oracle. And on the other side of the fence, you have Kick-Ass Patrol banning out the Omni Knight and the Enigma. don't recall seeing remaining. an Oracle Omni or Enigma in game Radiant one between these two teams. Pick. So the rest of those bands are likely just situational knowing what each team wants to play as here in game two. And you are going to Radiant see at least pick. one familiar face as Kick-Ass Patrol pick up a Keeper of the Light who saw some action in game one. As did the Spirit Breaker. So... It seems like Kick-Ass Patrol are going to be rolling with about the same squad as they did in Game 1. They won't have the Legion behind them, but so far, picking up heroes they're comfortable with and that they've won with in the form of Keeper of the Light and Spirit Breaker. Abra Zombie and Lich starting things off with the Supports Trent Protector. Always a good pick. He's able to kind of help sustain lanes remaining. and heroes with living armor and of course Five seconds the remaining. very apparent team fight mechanic in his ultimate is overgrowth which just locks down heroes in place and depending on when he catches the spirit breaker it could even disrupt some of his charge into ultimate combinations so Not a bad pickup, but with their second pick overall, they're definitely taking a little bit more time with it and eating into some of their reserve time to figure out how they're going Dire to be able to do ban. this. And they decide to go with the Bane, whose Fiend Grip is going to be able to work through BKBs, so a hero like Spirit Breaker isn't going to have a lot of recourse in terms of how to bypass the Bane. And it's going to limit Spirit Breaker's charging targets pretty dramatically if the Bane is positioned correctly since Bane is going to be able to nightmare whoever the Spirit Breaker is trying to right click or nightmare the Spirit Breaker himself or Fiend's Grip the Spirit Breaker he has a, a ton of disabled mechanics and even if all of those are on cooldown for some reason he can always just toss up the Enfeeble which is going to make Spirit Breaker um, hit like a teddy bear The third ban overall is Ten seconds for remaining. the side of Abra Zombie and Lich is going to be the Shadow Shaman. Five Here we saw remaining. played in game two between Plasma Nation and time. X Zone, but I don't know that he ever Radiant even got level ban. six in those two games. Both of those were completed within the sub 15 minute mark, so the supports were a little bit starved for both experience Radiant and gold. Pick. Kick-Ass Patrol throwing out some of their first respect bands of the draft, getting rid of the Juggernaut and the Death Prophet, both of whom they had to face into in Game 1. And it looked like the Death Prophet, especially in the last five minutes, was able to put up quite a 
resistance in terms of defending the high ground. Remaining. Five seconds remaining. Reserve time. Lycan. Meanwhile, I'm receiving Dying text messages King. from my friends, and all it says is your mom. So, now you guys know, Darmancast has the classiest friends in all of the Dota land. For those of you watching in-game, my name is Darman. I am coming to you live on twitch.tv slash Darmancast, as well as in-game. I have a YouTube channel. I have a Twitter account. Uh, once this game is completed, I'll be boxing up this video and throwing it out Five to my remaining. YouTube channel. So, if you miss anything the first go around, worry not. The replay will be made available. Come check it out at twitch.tv slash DarmanCast, and I'll have links to my channel there for you. Kick-Ass Patrol picking up the Lycan for their third pick. They're going to have some decent push potential there in, in the Wolves and, and the Howl. As well as Keeper. So Keeper is renowned as a hero who's able to stall out enemy pushes by just blasting them down with his channeled Illuminate spell. But if you use that aggressively and just force a lane back, behind a creep wave of your own and Lycan Wolves, you'll be able to chip down a tower pretty quickly. Wind Ranger at your service. It'll definitely be able to be done within Ready that 13 minute pick. mark that you see a lot of pub Dota players going for now that the Winter Compendium has been released and I one of the quests the on that track is to get a 13 minute tower. Team pick. Slark. Speaking of 13 Bring minute towers, you get even more push potential coming out from the Cap Squad as they pick up a Nature's Prophet, but it's immediately answered by Abrazombie and Lich, who pick up a Slark. As always, we know Slark is one of those Ten heroes whose remaining. impact in the game is going to be very dependent Five on his capabilities of finding farm in the early stages of the game, and then using that farm to snowball into Dire multiple kills bad. in the mid and into the late game of the match. Suspecting that the Wind Ranger is going Ten to be played remain. mid, Kick-Ass Patrol opts to ban out an offlaner, Five and they get rid remain. of the Clockwork, who's always been one of those heroes that... Ten seconds remaining has offlane potential. He has great initiation. He's relatively tanky. Great he has the ability to pick. isolate heroes. He has good catch. He has uh, the global ability in the form of rocket. So he's able to use that to scout out enemy positions to maybe pick off heroes who escape with just a sliver of health. It's like, you know, your, your mini Zeus ult, if you will. But a lot more luck based than the Zeus ult. The Zeus ult luck is based off of Ten whether or not you can remaining. find the R key. The uh, Clockwork Five missile is remaining. a bit more dependent on whether or not you can find the enemy hero, which is a much more difficult challenge. Reserve time. Unless you're drunk. If you're drunk, finding that R key can be just as difficult as finding an enemy hero. But enough about me and my exciting weekend activities of drunkenly stumbling around the keyboard. The last band from Abazombie and Lich is going to be the Lena. And so now it's on Kick-Ass Patrol who are likely going to be looking for... I'd say a middle hero here. They'll probably put Keeper in the hard position 5. And they pick up a Necrophos. So... Like we saw earlier today on the Darman Cast channel, Necrophos is one of those heroes who can be used to not directly amplify a push, but can be used to reinforce a push that already exists. So 
any anywhere you have a Lycan with his wolves and Nature's Prophet with all of his trans, if Necrophos just kind of rotates underneath that position and Five Death pulses remaining. all of those creeps up in terms of health, he's going to be able to sustain that push and help drive that Five push longer remaining. than it would have been able to otherwise. That's Dr. Thorg joining the Darmacast channel. I appreciate it. And yep, I was casting some top of the line Division 3 Dota once again. Uh, those Division 3 games have already been completed though. So if you are looking for Plasma Nation versus X Zone, I can tell you guys that Plasma Nation won that series 2-0. And they did so in pretty decisive fashion, picking up a bunch of early pushing heroes like Lone Druid. And they took game one in 14 minutes and 2 seconds, and game two they took in 12 minutes and 58 seconds. So, yep, that heroic level matchup is already complete, and that's what's allowing me time to remaining. jump over here to the entry level bracket where we have game two starting up between Abra Zombie and Lich and Kick-Ass Patrol. So for those of you just joining the channel, that's who we're going to have live here right now. And hopefully unlike that heroic matchup, I'm going to be able to get through introductions before these two teams start going at each other's throats. So walking through introductions here for kick-ass patrol we have dr dread playing the necrophos looks like he's going to be playing a support necro already half completing the mechanism on the keeper of the light let's see if we can get it here riding on his reindeer we have 17 shortcuts playing keeper of the light on the spirit breaker we have chickenometry Taking on the role of Space Cow. Heading into the bot lane, it looks like we're going to have a clash here. You have Silky Johnson playing the Lycan, and they're going to red, run headlong into the AZL lineup. And it's Slurk who makes first contact, landing a pounce against the Necro. And now the chase is on by Baden, who's right clicking him down. He pops the Apothic Shield, and with that final right click, he's going to secure first blood. Now it's Train Protector throwing a Lich Seed onto 17 shortcuts. And with the right click coming now from all five heroes, Slark is going to be the beneficiary here of a second blood. So, two kills. And no rune. They're able to rotate the Nature's Prophet uh, minion into the bottom lane and deny the rune. So, it's Silky Johnson who's playing the Lycan able to secure the top rune and LC who's playing the nature's prophet is able to get his trance into position and actually denies that bottom rune so making lemonade out of lemons here LC is able to put a silver lining on the cloud that was the lost first blood for the cap squad on the other side of the map here playing the Dire team. We have Abra Zombie and Lich. And it's Li Ivan Gao. It's Ivan Gao playing the Slark. Ostentatiously playing Bane in the top lane here. Give you some of their cosmetic views. The Woodland Shark. And I'm not sure if that was... Oh. I'm, I'm missing some kills here. So down in the bottom lane it was Lycan who died in exchange for the tree and protector and Lycan spawning and teleporting back to this bottom lane as 17 shortcuts looks to pressure the Abaden. Uh, I was working my way down here guys on introductions. Let's play nice for another 10 seconds here. As in the mid lane you have King Crusher 17 playing the Wind Ranger eating some of that heart stopper that the Necro has put one point into. And then in the bottom lane, last but not least, you have the tree and protector play, being played by Matt Cthulhu. Matt Cthulhu. Cthulhu. Matt Cthulhu. And then back in base for now, you have Baden, who's going to be played by Morphine. Dust 
Yeah, yeah so Dread. we have some some commentary on Dr. Dread here, who's Coin typically for renowned for playing the support, and you heard me call it early on that I thought he was going to be playing support, having picked up uh, half of the mechanism already as well in this bottom lane. Missing missing the fight, you have a Baden who picked off Keeper of the Light, who had been chasing down the the Abaden, and the Abaden's Apothic Shields are able to keep him in the fight long enough to secure the kill against Keeper of the Light and Nature's Prophet, who had teleported in. And then Lycan rotates up and is able to get one counter kill in the form of the tree into protector, so it's a two for one trade and while we weren't quite able to catch the fight recap that you can see on the net worth charts here it was, you capped them pretty even attack. in terms of net worth maybe favoring kick-ass patrol just slightly but nothing nothing too dramatic here at three minutes into the game so yeah as to Dr. Dread uh, rotating in positions here. You see Dr. Dread playing the mid lane right now. Uh, I think this could just be a hero based thing. They knew that they wanted Necro and they felt Necro's best position here would actually be in the mid versus anything else. With LC jumping into the jungle, it forces them to be rather short handed in terms of heroes so you have spear breaker in the off lane here which is his typical positioning and then if you also want to necro in the game where do you put him you're limited in terms of options and i need to just start watching this bottom lane here as a baden's able to secure another kill against the hard carry from kick-ass patrol and he's able to drop lycan but 17 shortcuts makes him pay with an Illuminate that catches him with just the tip. Hitting him with just the tip and making it a one for one exchange. But that is trading away your hard carry for an off lane of eight. Definitely still a core for a core, but which one's more valuable right now? Wasting no time and being aggressive, he gets back into lane, throws a shield on himself, and just so, jumps forward. But he eats a ton of damage as he does so, and Silky Johnson committing to this, diving himself and his wolves underneath the tower, and popping the, sh the shield, he's going to fall back. He's also got living armor on himself, so he'll be able to regen up fairly well, sitting on 15 base HP regen right now, off the back of that living armor and having eaten Tango. Excellent pull work coming out here from ostentatiously as he's able to pull the dr dryer, the dryer wave, the dire creep wave into this new neutral camp position and it gets completely denied from the spirit breaker who doesn't quite see it. I think he was in position to get some of the experience but that's about it. And now he's going to charge into the middle lane where Dr. Dread's going to look to rotate up and commit his ult. But level 1 ult doesn't do too much damage. It's definitely not the 50% you're used to. And with the heavy support rotation coming up from Train Protector and Bane, it's actually going to be the Spirit Breaker who ultimately falls. And Wind Ranger desperately trying to get away from these trance dives back underneath the tower, eating a bunch of right click damage, but not quite enough to be fatal and she's going to be able to get back and get to safety. 17 shortcuts popping Dyer's middle and tower illusion is under attack. He's going to try to pull this creep wave away from the middle Radiant's tower, tower get some chip damage attack. done here. As well as here's some last hits with attack. the illusions, which is always fun. It's essentially free last hits that you don't need to really think about. Baden being isolated here in the bottom lane, presumably by himself. Silky John is going to make it go on him. He commits his ult, but as soon as it's popped, he actually is going to have to run away as the Treant Protector has rotated into position here. Abaden popping his bar of time is going to heal back up to about two thirds health, as well as having uh, a shield on him. But with LC teleporting into the bot lane, he's going to catch 
the Lycan inside of a tree prison for a little bit. Silky Johnson really wants this kill, so he's going to jump forward try to get a piece of it himself. And he's definitely going to get some experience for that, but he sacrifices his life to do so. So he is currently 1-3, and, and that's not a position you want to be in as a hard carry. But his wolves lived through the fight, and they're going to be around for another 10 seconds here, which, bottom tower is along with the attack. treants, is going to be enough time to right-click the tower a couple times, but then they're going to have to back off. The wolves are going to just naturally decay here as the treants head into the bottom room and secure double damage for LC. Double damage! With me. The Treant and Faden forcing 17 shortcuts out of position here, not out of position, back in the lane, uh, back towards his tower. He's going to briefly charge up and illuminate, and this is where he's going to be able to get some of his solo experience and get back in this game a little bit. He's level 6, but he hasn't put a point into his ultimate yet. I wonder if that's just because they're so starved for the chakra magic and the ability to nuke people down with that illuminate that it was intentional or if it was a sort of misclick. So hard to tell without not being in the team's uh, team speak channel. He's going to throw a monoleak onto Morphe here, but since he was immediately tossed into Sprout, there's not going to be much there for him. Trian committing his ultimate, but is Radiant's getting charged by Spirit Breaker and gets the teleport off just in time. And it looked like the Spirit Breaker charged straight through the Trant Protector. Now it's Keeper of the Light trying to zone out the Abaden, and he's going to eat a bunch of right click for this Radiant's as Abaden walks forward to zone that Keeper out. But it's Silky Johnson who has the movement speed now. And he's going to chase down this Abaddon. He secures the kill. He does get Leech Seed applied to him. And the tower damage coming out. You see he was the only person there diving the Abaddon. It's going to be too much in Lycan. Maybe overcommitting once again. He is able to secure the offlane kill. But once again at the expense of the Abaddon lane carry. But the rest of... The cap squad are still on the lane and they're still here to push. So they have the trance behind them, they have some of the creep wave, and and they want to stick around, at least for now, until the Abaden teleports in and the Treant reveals himself from the shadows. He's looking to body block as much as possible until he pops his ult lane sit against three heroes and they're able to drop just one for now, the Keeper of the Light, until Bane commits his Fiend's Grip onto Dr. Dread, and they're able to kill him. Meanwhile, further up, you had the Treant Protector get the right-click kill onto Spirit Breaker. So it's a three-man loss for Kick-Ass Patrol as they look to play the aggressive pushing strategy we've seen quite frequently today in the 82L League. With a uh, half team wipe here, we'll look to see what AZL does with it. We have their mid and their support kind of hanging out in, in their secret shop, and it doesn't look like they're going to commit too heavily to a push here. The bottom tower is still sitting at full health, and you can see Abaden just kind of falling back here, poking his head into the jungle, looking for any possible rotations that might be there. But it's actually the middle lane that's in jeopardy now, as Elsie, Silky Johnson, 17 shortcuts all make their way to push in here. And Abaden, not afraid of danger at all as he charges forward. In the back lines, ostentatiously gets charged by the Spear Breaker. He's going to commit a nightmare onto him and then join his team. And the rest of the fight where Trent Protector had committed his overgrowth, but not to a, a great effect. They're able to keep her the light and Necropost low. Silky Johnson and Chickenometry both hanging out in the back lines, tearing through the Bane, tearing through the Treant Protector, and it's going to force a buyback out of the Treant Protector at the very least. I didn't quite see that one as 
Lycan is able to secure his third kill of this team fight, dropping the Wind Ranger. Now Slark, not quite finished with his Shadow Blade, sitting inside the invisibility from his Shadow Amulet, is going to be hit by a Keeper Illuminate, but not enough to kill him, so he's going to be able to regenerate, complements his Shadow Dance ultimate. Rain has 10 seconds, 15 seconds left on his ultimate, so he's going to be charged by the Cap Squad, and they have vision on him. He's been dusted, so he tries to teleport away, but the whole team's there saying, not today, and it's Lycan who secures the kill, so that is the two bottom towers, the two middle towers, and a fairly successful uh, hero kill ratio for them as well. Now you can only imagine that Cap are looking to the few towers that remain tower outside of the tier 3 towers for AZL and that's exactly where all the heroes are heading on both sides Dyer's of the, the map is under attack. Dyer's structures are fortified. King Crusher slightly Dyer's out of position here is going to teleport attack. up to the Dyer's tier 2 tower, tower they're fallen. just willing to sacrifice their tier 1 to hopefully stage a better defense at the tier 2 tower where they suspect Cap is going. That's exactly going to be the case. Charge is committed to the Slark, but an excellent shackle shot is going to catch him right next to the tower and pin him to the tree line. And it's Slark who's going to be able to get the first kill of this team fight against the Spirit Breaker, ostentatiously very near death as Silky Johnson was chasing him down, is going to commit the Fiend's Grip, and from Death's door, they turn around and they kill the Lycan. Another Shackle Shot being landed by the Wind Ranger is going to help drop the Necrophos, and it's going to be a 3 for nothing defense here as the Tier 2 Tower in the top lane still stands. It ate about five, 600 damage throughout the course of that team fight, but it's... Uh, the death of three cores on the side of Kick-Ass Patrol that tell the true story there. And you can see a 2600 gold exchange and a 2500 experience exchange in favor of AZL. Kill Dodo, best Dodo, huh? On Twitch chat? Uh, yeah, if you're a big fan of kills, I recommend watching the replays that I'll be posting to my YouTube channel. Uh, in game one of the heroic bracket cast tonight, uh, they were averaging. It was a 15-minute game, and they were averaging a kill every 27 seconds. It was insane, and that was just for one team. So far, this game as a whole is averaging about as many kills, a little bit less. But coming up on the 16-minute mark here. AZL have secured 16 kills for themselves, while Kick-Ass Patrol have secured just 10, which, you know, 15 minutes into the game is, isn't is that bad. But uh, both teams playing hyper-aggressively here, and you can see they just secured that kill against the Wind Ranger in the middle lane. And now, hoping to push into the high ground with their next big push, they jump into the Roche pit very quickly, and, and they're just melting through him on the back of all of this fighting force. They have, uh, it's going to be Silky Johnson on the like hand who picks up the Aegis of the Immortal, and Ping's coming out from AZL saying, hey guys, let's defend the bot. And that is going, I'm not sure who uh, pinged out the bot tier three tower, but they are definitely harnessing their predictive capabilities because that is exactly where Kick-Ass Patrol are going to be heading. And now for the first uphill push of the game as Silky Johnson leads the charge and Slark having finished his Shadow Blade is going to jump into the background and he actually engages against the Necrobos while Sil Silky Johnson focuses on the tower. Overgrowth is going to be committed, the Aegis has been popped, the Necro has been killed and Slark in the back lines just picking off these backline heroes picking off the necro moving on to the keeper having dropped the nature's prophet as well now they're chasing after the lycan and a well-placed power shot from the wind range is going to be able to secure him so they traded a bane and half of the health from the tier three tower in exchange for four heroes plus the aegis 
and it's another 3,000 gold exchange, about 3,000 experience. And you can see these charts are just swinging back and forth as the Kick-Ass Patrol Squad are able to secure tower after tower, but AZL are, are starting to figure out the equation of this game, and they're able to mount successful defenses both at the top tier 2 and the bottom tier 3 tower. Train Protector trying to get his, himself back to safety, trying to get to the floor so he can invis up. I think at the beginning there, he was still underneath vision t vision range of the tower. He eats the Reaper Scythe coming out from Necrophos, who's still not level 11, so it's sitting at just l the level 1, so it's only doing 0.4 damage for every HP missing, which isn't that much. You need to drop him essentially beneath a quarter of their health pool after mitigation and everything is taken into effect it, it's about a quarter of the health pool a lot of people at level one cast it around uh, a third of the health pool or sometimes if they're really overestimating things they'll, they'll cast it at half HP and it also depends on how much damage you can get done before the reaper site hits because there is a delay to that cast animation and it's about I don't know half a second which doesn't seem long but you, you can get one or two right clicks done in there as well as a death pulse so if you're standing right on top of them already you're going to be able to get that death pulse damage done speaking of death there's two more kills being picked off by AZL as Fiend's Grip is utilized on Keeper of the Light and then the Leech Seed is going to keep Silky Johnson inside the Dire Jungle long enough for the rest of the squad to right click him down. Dyer's bottom tower is under attack. Right click him down as well as land a power shot from the Wind Ranger. But in the bottom lane you have Rat Dodo coming out as Chickenometry is pushing the bottom lane he charges to the top lane and on his way out he does eat a shackle shot which stuns him temporarily and he, he's just being crowd controlled here as he gets hit by a second yeah, shackle shot having already attack. eaten a nightmare from the bane but the nature's prophets continuing to shove these treants uphill and try to do damage to these towers you have living armor being utilized by the screen protector pretty much on cooldown trying to heal this tower back up to full health and get it back into fighting shape Ivan Gouge spotting out these two heroes that he was able to pick off before and it's going to be the keeper of the light who goes forward to ward by himself and is going to be met by a treant protector and a ravenous slark who was sitting there stalking him from the shadows already radiance bottom tower is under attack and you have AZL are, are picking off these defenses very well and you can see here between team fights now that cap have slowed down their aggressive tower push AZL have taken it upon themselves to start playing more aggressive and they're getting these pickoffs. You saw they, they got the pickoff against the Keeper and the Lycan in their own jungle. They got another pickoff there against Keeper. So I'm, I'm sure he's near the bottom of the net worth. Yeah, he's the lowest radiant net worth in the game right now. Uh, so not the most valuable pickoff they can find, but still something is something and now you have charge being committed by trigonometry as he jumps forward onto the slark but he's sitting on top of uh, living armor as well as his ultimate so he's going to be safe regardless of how hard the space cat wanted to commit there but spotting him out once again he's, he's going to join the necrophos who committed his ultimate and they've spotted him out here they have him surrounded they commit the nether strike and the sprout and 
with four heroes in position here to right click them down that's going to be enough they had vision coming out from the Necronomicon on the nature's prophet so they had vision of him the entire time and there, there was no getting away in terms of the shadow blade of course his shadow dance is impervious to reveal mechanics which I think is absolutely insane but you can still see where he's at in terms of his smoke mechanic or the smoke graphic that's on the map some odd stalling techniques being played here I guess as the sprout comes out onto the Abaden, who then eats another strike attack. and it cuts through the woods. It's just, for now I think all of this is just a space creation technique, as in the top lane, Silky Johnson and LC are able to push down the tier 2 tower. And if you pay attention here to the Illuminate Blast coming out from Keeper of the Light, I think he does have, there it is, the Kinetic Gem on his horse and you can see his illusion actually has antlers as well so he's firing this specific deer mount thing Let's see if we can get a good shot here before there's a another team fight Nope, not going to be able to see it from downhill like that. Oh well, but definitely one of the things that keeps Dota interesting and fresh for those of you who have seen the new Winter Compendium and the Winter Treasures. There's a, a lot of heroes that are... Valve was always strict about their cosmetic items and you had to maintain a primary color on each hero but enough about cosmetics as there's a fight underway inside the radiant jungle 17 shortcuts is caught out by a smoke azl lineup and a slark leading the charge but he's going to eat the brunt of it as dr dread's able to commit the reaper site successfully this time onto the slark and he's now going to be out of the game for the next 70 seconds as spirit breaker eats the right click damage from the remainder of the azl lineup but He's sitting on top of a glimmer cave, so he's going to be able to disengage relatively easily as the rest of his team focuses down the tree and protector. And having regened up thanks to this urn, he's back in fighting shape. He charges forward onto the bane. They get their third kill, and now is the opening that the cap squad should have been looking for. They get three kills in their jungle. Slark is still dead for another 35 seconds. Check and buyback status. Slark, where's Slark? Does have it. So if he wants to commit it here, he can. But the tower's at full health, and he's got allies who are actually not looking to defend bot. And now you have pushes going on in all three lanes. You have Silky Johnson pushing the mid. It was Keeper of the Light who pushed this. Or excuse me, Silky pushing top. It's Keeper of the Light pushing mid. And 17 shortcuts in the mid lane is going to fall to King Crush, who misses the power shot, so it's going to be slightly off the mark. And he's going to be able to walk away to safety. Meanwhile, in the bot lane, the tier 3 tower has eaten half of its damage, but it's the fight breaking out in the top lane. That's the true danger here. And Kick Ass Patrol have maybe split up a little too much. And as a result, they lose three heroes. They lose Dr. Dredd on his Necro, they lose Silky Johnson on his Lycan and LC on the Nature's Prophet. 17 shortcuts is the fourth to fall here, netting a double kill for King Crusher on, on his Wind Ranger. The fight recap only going to show that last kill there, but fairly good defense considering three heroes were dead from AZL. They lose a top tier 3 tower, they lose a top ranged racks, not even the melee racks, and that's it. This bottom tower is already getting the healing treatment from the treant protector here. 
so that's eventually going to be healed back up to full. And you can see Tran definitely doing everything he can to keep uh, his base as secure as he can. Now it may be AZL's turn to play the aggressors as they spot out Roshan. And they're actually pinging the middle lane, so... Ping's coming out from both teams here. They know the train protector is near. And they drop a sentry ward, so they are going to be able to see him committing the charge. They're going to focus down the train protector first before he's able to get an overgrowth off. And the Sprout in position here, it's blocking out the entire AZL lineup. So they're not able to get uphill to save their Slark. They're going to have to run the long way around. So it's by time Slark jumps into his ultimate and just looks to escape. But Kick-Ass Patrol have already done the damage they need to do. And AZL are looking to escape back to base. But Bane is not going to be able to make it. I wasn't sure if he had a Shadow Amulet or what, because he just kind of stopped there. But... He does eventually come out since it was just a glimmer cape and it's Lycan who picks up that kill and once again the kick-ass patrol squad are going to look to press their advantage here having dropped two heroes admittedly just the two supports so maybe not the best kills uh, that they were hoping for but enough space to hopefully take out one of these melee racks they get the tier 3 tower down uh, buybacks from both buybacks from the Bane and I think Train Protector just respawned naturally, then he teleported to the then dying tier 3 tower, immediately committed the overgrowth. Then Bane trying to lock down Silk Johnson as they're only able to get him to half. When Ranger focus firing him down from there is going to be able to get the second kill as in the back lines. It was Slark who's constantly rotating into the back underneath his underneath his shadow blade is able to pick off Dr. Dread on his necromancer. And Geometry here charging forward and he, he ends the mega kill streak of Wind Ranger so that's worth 600 gold to him and now Bane who had bought back into the game is going to be cut out here I don't think this is going to technically qualify as a die back? It kind of does I mean he's going to be down for 50 seconds regardless and it's getting to the point now where even though there's only two heroes left for kick-ass control if they lose many more it's going to be at least one if not I mean, two sets of racks as the top lane has already been pushed in by these creeps and LC on the nature's prophet is going to teleport up here actually he was here the whole time I take that back he, he didn't die so it's LC and chickenometry just two manning down this bottom lane of racks I think ultimately the spirit breaker may have to die for it and there is the leap from Slark or the pounce from Slark is going to get that kill but trading a spirit breaker for the second set of racks is okay by cap. So, two sets of racks, all that's left for the AZL squad is this a middle set. And you can see the living armor being applied there. They know this is going to be their last stand. You can see the AZL flag here. It's not really a. Uh, Abra zombie and lich. It's mostly just the zombie half. Not not so much lich. You get a little bit of the blue there, but uh, much more zombie than lich. Silk Johnson using this time to jump into the Roche pit. They don't have anyone on the cap squad yet that has uh, any sort of armor reduction stuff. So 17 shortcuts sending some illusions up. It's growing out of line. It is going to disjoint the shackle shot there a little bit. It looked like that might have been good beforehand, but he does ultimately give up his life just to provide some of that additional vision. I don't know if that was a pound from Slark as he tried to get into the Roche pit, not able to do so. So Lycan's able to grab that E just and make his way back to his side of the map and to safety. And right now, it's a waiting game. Kick-Ass Patrol can choose to wait this one out as long as they want because creep equilibrium will always be in their favor. Uh, AZL don't have a ton of creep clearing potential. They have <clears throat> excuse me, the Maelstrom up on the Slark. I think they're 
No, no sort of cleave mechanics on a Baden who's opted to go for more of a like utility build here in the form of a Yules and a Vladimir's. So not uh and even the Wind Ranger doesn't have a um, Majolner or any strong wave clearing mechanics either. Kappa Rats! A little bit. I mean, they, they haven't been playing true Alliance style Rat Dota. Um, they've just been playing more Murder Ball Dota, where they group up as five and just <clears throat> steamroll down a lane hell or high water. For a while there, AZL had figured out the equation and were able to mount very successful defenses and come out the victors in both maintaining the health of their towers as well as getting three, four kills themselves. And you can see when those fights occurred, there were these big dips back in favor of the Dire, but since then they lost the top racks, they lost the bottom, and now it's Cap who are looking to push into the high ground here. Dr. Dredd stepping forward, he gets the death pulse off, he's looking for someone to use his ultimate on him. In his death throws, he decides to just throw it out there onto a near full health of Aiden. So it doesn't do much to him. Silky Johnson, meanwhile, has burned the E just, and he's just looking to tank up this uh, AZL lineup. Wind Ranger in the back lines here, fighting against 17 shortcuts, and LC will ultimately fall once Wind Run fades. Four heroes have already died on the side of AZL, with one buyback being committed by Slark as he looks to zone the Spirit Breaker out. But that's all Spirit Breaker is looking to do is zone these heroes out as the rest of his team take the middle racks. Elsie walking forward here, he's able to land Sprout against the Slark and some right clicks and a charge from Trigonometry is going to spell the dieback for that Slark and Morph Morphine teleporting in to kind of commit the last second YOLO play, but good game is ultimately called by Wind Ranger, and that is game two going the way of kick-ass control in this best of two series. My name is Darman. I've been coming to you live both in Dota TV and on Twitch.tv slash DarmanCast. Congratulations to both kick-ass patrol who won this series, this best of two series, 2-0, two and to Plasma Nation who won their series uh, two zero. So, very excellent Dota play tonight, all around. And you can see the meta in AD2L Season Ten, at least for Week Four, is definitely favoring these very push-heavy, push-centric lineups. But how, how much did I butcher that word? Let's give that one another shot. Lineups. So we've seen multiple Necrophoses and not in the form of a roaming, ganking, I'm going to use my ult to kill the hard carry type necros, but necros utilized for their death pulse just to sustain team pushes. We have seen Keeper of the Lights just blasting wave after wave to keep creep equilibrium on the opponent's side of the map. We've seen Nature's Prophet, both in the heroic bracket and the entry bracket here, utilizing those treants to just destroy lanes. We've seen lone druids. We've seen enchantresses. We've seen chens. Uh, everything you could imagine from those push-heavy lineups being used to its fullest potential here today. And it's a meta to keep an eye out for. And we'll see if it's something that continues into week five because it's proven to be very effective here by both winning squads. So, once again, congratulations to both teams here in this matchup, Kick-Ass Patrol and Abra Zombie and Lich. It's been a pleasure to cast. I'm glad I was able to sneak in here for Game 2 at least, and the last five minutes of Game 1. I hope you've enjoyed the cast, everyone. And I'm not sure when my next casts are scheduled. I have a special treat being planned for this Sunday. I will be casting some original Dota 1 matches, I believe. That's going to be early on in the AM. So if you're a bit of a morning bird and don't mind watching Dota at 8, 9, 10 AM, tune in for that. And then we will be back uh, after that for some more 82L action. I'm not sure if there's games being played tomorrow, but if so, I will tweet out the times 
that I'll be casting those as well. So, thank you for tuning in. I'm going to either play some Dota myself, try to knock off some of these Winter Compendium quests, or I might play around with uh, Mini Metro, which is a game I saw on uh, some YouTube channels and wanted to give a shot myself, so fun little game. Until next time, guys. Good fun. Have luck out there. Bye.